Look, I agree with Deputy Shortall. I think there is a certain irony in the fact that we're discussing this here now because the Minister wanted to move changes to the scheme in relation to pensions, but when we tried to move at a committee stage, it was deemed to be out of order for the purposes of uh, the Act as it was. And I think there is an urgency in this situation, and even though it is uh, the last hour or late in the day, I think you have to start listening to this, and I know you've met the groups of pensioners in the airport groups, but there is a perception that government isn't listening enough, and it's not just a perception. In fairness, it is a reality, because these are people whose conditions of employment meant they had no choice whatsoever but to participate in this pension scheme. They are people whose colleagues um, across the water in, in Britain and in America face a situation for working for the Irish National Airline and having their pension rights secured, but those who gave, in many instances, a lifetime of work contributing to that pension scheme are facing cuts to their living standards on the scales uh, outlined by the other deputies. Now, we're talking in these amendments about dealing with cases where defined benefit pension schemes have funding problems, and I think we would accept that funding problems exist. I think it's appropriate to use the uh, example of the IAS scheme, but that's only half the question. Because the question is, if there's a problem with funding, who pays for that problem? And what these motions seek to do is to say that the present scenario, which has workers and their families paying the price of something that was not their problem to begin with, uh, that somebody else should bear that cost. And the somebody else is the employers in this situation. And we're not saying that lightly. We're saying it based on a number of very serious and important precedents. I think the first one is one which was referred to earlier. It is the fact of previous legislative rulings in the High Court, no less, by uh, people like Justice uh, Murphy, which deemed that the IAS scheme was a contingent creditor in terms of Aer Lingus. That court judgment said, actually, that Aer Lingus owed that scheme 500 million in a contingent liability. Now, that's Aer Lingus, which is only one of the employers in the scheme, but as everybody knows, uh, obviously the amount of monies that are being put in by the employer in this situation is nothing near 500 million. In actual fact, no money has been put into this scheme at all. What the employers are doing is taking money and putting it into a different pension scheme to benefit um, uh, the, the, some of the current uh, employees. So I would say there is serious legal precedent and unless the government addresses and listens to what this house, side of the house is saying, then it will end up, uh, as Deputy uh, Shortall said, in terms of legal action, which I think will be really regrettable for everybody. Nobody needs the stress and the expense of uh, that situation. I think we would have to say that it's not just legal precedent supporting our argument, but the very fact if you like, that the, it was the company that decided to release people in many instances has been uh, a factor in why people uh, left the company er early and why maybe some of the, the strains, for want of a better word, were uh, put in because the employers chose to have new entrants join a different pension scheme and not join this scheme, even though that scheme was a condition of uh, employment previously. But I do think as well that somebody has to be called to account. I mean, the, the other deputies are right in talking about the deferred pensioners. I'll make a point about them in a minute. But the existing pensioners are also taking an immediate hit come the 1st of January. These people are the group who are going to face a six-week per annum uh, cut in their living standards from the 1st of uh, January. And these people are already subject to the pension levy of 2.53%. Uh, so you're talking about a substantial amount of money coming out of an average pension of about 15,000 uh, euros and then of course the active pensioners also are going to be in a much less favourable uh, position as well. Now why is this pension scheme in trouble? 
It's not because of the actions of these people and their families. Actually, the steps that they took, including many of those who, on the encouragement of the company, left early as part of a package which guaranteed them this type of pension when they retired. And they did that because these were reputable state companies that they thought they had a right to believe uh, in what was being said to them. The company saved a lot of money by those people leaving early. And I think there's a misunderstanding in terms of the deferred groups of treating this group as if they were a sort of people who had short service, who went on to fulfil an alternative career in some other employment and maybe had access Access to another pension fund, but they're not. Many of these people have in actual fact contributed decades of work and some of these amendments seek to deal with the issue of long service being recognised, which is absolutely critically important because currently those people are incredibly uh, exposed. So these people aren't to blame for this. But could you paint a legitimate argument that other people are? I think you could, and I want to again put on the record that some of the investment decisions taken by that scheme have to be questioned, and I really think the Minister and the Minister for Transport have to initiate this, because we have to look at the facts. 2001, the employers advised the trustees to enter a freeze and de risk strategy, which was implemented. At that time, I, I suppose what in the interest of etiquette, I'll call it bizarre investment decisions were made. The trustees invested 800 million euros in Irish life. 57% of the scheme's money was tied up in Irish life. Why? That's against all best actuarial advice that a pension scheme should diversify. It was actually against the stated actuarial advice, which said that their, their property portfolio should be 9%. They brought it down to 0.5%. They were told that their equity portfolio should be around 41%, it was zero, and instead they went into fixed interest securities. Now, they switched hundreds of millions of pensioners' money to Irish Life Investments between April 12 and April 13, at a time when there were question marks over the future of Irish Life. Two of the three trustee directors have held very senior executive positions in Irish life. A very definite conflict of interest with the hundreds of millions of funds owned by the pensioners in uh, those companies. Against actuarial advice, they sold an equity portfolio worth 667 million. We've used examples of it before, but a unique, probably unrivaled, property portfolio in the centre of Dublin was sold for 58 million in 2013. Now this involves the passport office over in Molesworth Street, 15 to 16 Bagot Street, Stevens Green properties, the European Union office down the road in Molesworth Street, a Harcourt uh, centre uh, block as well. Property previously valued at 130 million was sold for 58 million in 2013, with a huge rental income coming from it. Now, Jones, Lang and LaSalle, who were involved in that, were the property advisors to the IAS pension scheme. They were also the selling agent for the property. They were also the valuation agent for the company that bought it. And they were located in one of the buildings. Now, I mean, seriously, you couldn't even make this stuff up in terms of the amount of conflict of interest that was there. They were also, uh, uh, Irish Life was an investment advisor to the IASS. So what I'm saying is, while I recognise that there's problems in that scheme, it's not the fault of the people who we are asking to pay the price of that. And I am really appealing for an investigation into what went on with those funds. I'd say our funds, because I'm a member of that pension scheme as well, having been an employee of Aer, Ling Aer Lingus. And it makes me sick to think that people who gave a lifetime of work to what was the state airline and those who are working in the airport authorities and indeed SR Technics are being treated uh, in this way. And unless we attend to that and deal with these motions, then they are going to pay the price for something that was never their problem in be to begin with. I want to re-emphasise the points made by the other deputies about the lack of involvement in the process of this. I mean, how sickening is it that pensioners and deferred members had no access to any of the discussions that went on around the expert panel? Uh, the union members had a vote on this. But union members in the companies now 
are not members of the IAS scheme, and they participated in a ballot on that, which is being used to sort of say that workers have been consulted and to leave people now with uh, starting with uh, six weeks less pay come uh, January. It really isn't good enough. The pensioner group has had no funds put into the scheme to mitigate the impact on them. Again, I think the motion number 21 in particular, tabled by myself and Deputy Collins, is trying to say that those with long service, that service has to be given a weight in this, in this factor in terms of actual uh, factors in the table that can be done and we had thought that it was going to be done when we discussed this in previous legislation but unfortunately uh, that wasn't the case in the guidance notes and, and that, that that followed so I do think that that absolutely needs to be uh, factored in because we, you know, we could have a scenario where actually the pensioner group are exposed to further liabilities uh, and cuts in the future. So, look, at I too, I know other deputies want to come in. We're coming near the end of this stage of it, but this is a last-minute appeal to the Minister. There are problems, but there are other solutions. There's never only one way to deal with the scenario. And I think if we don't turn to the points that deputies here are saying, we're saying that those who didn't create the problem have to pay the price of it. And it will end up in the courts. It'll end up in unwarranted stress and hardship for people who had a right to expect something different, a legitimate expectation, an expectation that has been backed up in other legislation and one that is um, uh, given to their colleagues across the water who work for the same companies. Surely we can come up with something better other than making those people pay.